What are we, those of us who love Hendrix, if not a nation of star-dusted dreamers? I'm uh, Greg Tate. I'm a journalist and a musician who lives in Harlem. For people who were born maybe 20 years ago, it's difficult to fathom the kind of musical earthquake Jimi Hendrix created at the end of the 60s. How would you describe his music to people of that age group? Well, I would direct them to uh, his first album release, Are You Experienced? Because um, I feel sonically what he did with the sound of guitar on that recording um, still sounds revolutionary, still sounds radical. The way he used distortion, the way he used feedback, the psychedelic melodic sense he brought, the thunderous rhythmic undertow that uh, came from his choice of Mitch Mitchell as a drummer. I mean, he took the blues and just rammed it full of of hyper spatial <laughs> electronic energies um which um are are still uh reverberating down to this day but i think um the music itself still sounds completely unlike anything anybody was doing then and that anybody's really doing now you know there's just something very um staggering about just uh his attack you know like where he comes in on a on a riff and the kind of the jagged discordant quality of those riffs you know but he's just such a a charismatic player too i mean he's just such a seductive player the wildest ideas he 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 has um um just still just draw you in suck you in you know, kind of stand you on your head and shake you out. The range of styles on that first album was quite unique at that time. Yeah, I mean, because he was a musical sponge. I mean, he listened and absorbed music from everybody. I mean, he was listening to, um, spent a lot of time listening to old classic blues, you know, uh, Muddy Waters and, and Lightning Hopkins and Howlin' Wolf and Jimmy Reed and, you know, kind of absorbing um, just the 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 crafted roughness roughneck elegance you know of that of that music and the um and just the powerful stark emotionality of that music as well you know just the way it directly speaks to us um uh you know with the with the singer's sense of joy and pain and and abandonment you know um and you know he brought that you know into contemporary pop music, contemporary rock music of, of the period, you know, just in a very full-bodied way, you know. But he was listening to the Beatles at that time. He was listening to Bob Dylan a lot at that time. He really um, was listening to, to jazz people as well, uh, like Sun Ra and Rasan Roland Kirk and, and Miles Davis, you know, because he was in the village in that period where, you know, those musicians were, were developing um you know modern jazz and and avant-garde modern jazz you know ornette coleman's and albert eilers and so forth so i mean he brought all that energy into into rock as well you know just um you know those those musicians really um you know made uh you know made dissonant swing in a way that it never had before made kind of the extreme sounds that one could get out of uh, the brass and reed instruments, you know, musical. And um, I think he was interested, very much just in, interested in doing something like that on the guitar as well. Um, yeah, I think, I mean, saxophone players, you know, just um, their, um, their ability to, to, to really improvise at length and to create this long, fluid, sustained sound was something that... Um, He transferred to the guitar once he got his hands on, um, you know, distortion pedals and wah-wah pedals and uh, univibes and, and so forth. You know, he, he, that kind of fluidity and fluency he heard in, in horn players and that, that ability to, to, to sustain, um, you know, notes for long periods of time, you know, the way that horn players do with their breath. I mean, he brought all of that to the guitar. 
Another aspect of his guitar playing you mention in your book is his rhythm guitar playing, which he developed when he was playing as a sideman in R&B bands backing soul singers. You also talk about his ability to combine rhythm and solo playing. Could you pinpoint songs that demonstrate this ability? Yeah, well, I think in particular, if you listen to um, the album Access Bold is Love, I think there's where he really made his chordal sensibility like very pronounced in every song. So you hear, um, you know, the influence of, of people like Wes Montgomery and, and Curtis Mayfield and, you know, Jimmy Nolan from James Brown's band. But um, you also hear him kind of compliment um, melodically uh, with his, with his, his overtracked leads, everything that he's doing, he's doing rhythmically. But if you take, you know, you take a song like Castles Made of Sand or Axis Bold as Love, I mean, there's so much just fluidity between the lead and the rhythm parts. They really sound as if one is just an extension of the other. And um, you don't really, and in fact, you don't even really, in a song, in songs like those, um, uh, there's something about the way he brings the whole thing together. He holds the whole thing together, like with sound, you know what I mean? With, um, with just a, a consistency in terms of um, uh, the dreamlike quality of the sound he's getting out of the guitar. So that you don't, you don't really think of, uh, lead and rhythm as being as being separated you know or as uh, as being um you know foreground background it's all in your face it's all foreground and if you are going to learn those things like you have to spend as much time getting the nuances of the the chordal parts down as you do um you know the the single line aspects You know, I mean, uh, you know, in jazz, jazz guitarists in particular do this thing called chordal solos, where they'll use actually the the chord progressions to actually create, you know, an improvise a solo statement. You know, and he was very aware of that and brought that into into his music. You know, the emancipation of noise as an expressive force can be witnessed in the playing of some horn players in the '60s and in the guitar playing of Jimi Hendrix. Yeah, I mean, as I was saying, I mean, he really wanted, um, you know, the guitar, of course, um, um, electric guitar is dependent on amplification um, to, to make itself felt, you know, but for much of the 20th century outside of jazz, I mean, it's definitely been, you know, an accompanying instrument, um, a supporting instrument for vocalists. You know, or in um, in Count Basie's band, I mean, Freddie Green, in some ways, was like um, a second piano and a second bass player. You know, somebody there to really just hold down, you know, that, that strong swing rhythm. Hendrix, I mean, on the one hand, was very much influenced by the electric blues players out of Chicago. Um, you know, the, the Buddy Guys and the Hubert Sumlins and, you know, Muddy Waters slide playing and B.B. King's playing. You know, so strong leads were, were definitely a part of the electric blues tradition. But Hendrix really wanted to take the way that those those guys used the guitars as a second melodic voice in a song and really extend um, the statement, you know, extend it the way that, um, you know, people like Ornette Coleman and John Coltrane were doing with their saxophones where they state, like a melody at the top of the song, and then go into a 5, 10, 15 minute solo where um, they were really kind of challenging the orthodoxy around what was beautiful in music, you know. And they heard this other kind of beauty coming from, you know, playing, you know, doing what's called multiphonics, where you finger in a way that allows you to create. Um, the sound of two and three notes at the same time and, you know, really also just screaming through the horn and, you know, taking that, that kind of, that kind of, um, vocal language that had always, it always been implied or it always been a part of jazz saxophone and trumpet playing, you know what I mean? You had, you know, Duke Ellington's, um, 
you know, some of his trumpet players like Cootie Williams and Bubba Miley, you know, the way they would use the plunger mute to create these vocal effects and these wah-wah effects. But the horn players could really just sustain the energy and the intensity of, of like one note, you know, for a long period of time, you know, in a way that just, just, it just really just kind of penetrated your skull and got under your skin, you know, and until Hendrix came along and really pushed the envelope in terms of volume and in terms of, um, you know, using distortion and feedback, you know, in this very, um, um, melodic improvisatory way, um, you know, the guitar had been limited in terms of its ability to, to create these, um, liquid legato kinds of passages, you know, where it was more about the quality of the sound than even the notes themselves, you know, cause I mean, jazz players, uh, jazz guitar players and, and blues players were, um, you know, they were using the guitar in a way that was very, is very much about the note selection. And these horn players, you know, from the swing era on, had really made just the sound, the individual quality of the sound they could get, you know, really the focus. You know, that was the thing that held everything together. You know, note selection was a part of it, but what really held the notes, the stream of notes together, was the personality of the sound. And Hendrix was able to, he tapped into that because he had the equipment, he had the technology. It was very new technology that had come online. I mean, just around the time that he got to England, you know, the the stack 100 watt Marshall amps where you could create enough volume out of uh, two and three amps to just fill a hall with as much sound as a symphony. You know, when you take a guitar you know, when you kind of have, you take those, those amplifiers and you've got them turned up to 10 or 11, you know, um, you start to get some other kind of harmonic qualities to the sound. The sound starts carrying all these intense overtones with it, you know, and they have a, almost like a sub vocal quality of their own, you know, so you're hearing, you're in these notes, uh, these sequences of notes that Hendrix is playing but you're also hearing these ghost tones, these phantom tones that are coming over as well. And and the thing is, you know, I mean, feedback generally in any kind of um, amplified sound situation is something people want to avoid, you know, because it's uh, it's harsh. You know what I mean? It's It can be um, um, really kind of piercing to the ear. But Hendrix heard a lyrical possibility in there, uh, uh, kind of a melodious possibility in there, and so you know he had an, he developed enough control over this kind of banshee, this techno banshee sound that was coming out of the 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 instrument because of feedback, and actually learned to control it and learn to use it um, as a way to create secondary melodies in his music. So. When you hear him, you get you get the phenomenon of harmonic feedback, where it's not just wildly feeding back, but it's feeding back in a way that's connected to um, the uh, the the foundation, the spine of the song, you know, to the to the to the the bass and chord progressions of the song, you know, and you know, I mean, it's just really one of the the more startling aspects of his playing, and really. Um, it's hard to think of anybody else who's even pursued that line of, of investigation into the, the possibility of the instruments, you know, with that kind of control. Yeah, and the thing is, um, you know, if you see a lot of guitar players when they want to invoke feedback, you know, they'll, they'll turn around and face the amplifier because that'll set up like a, you know, a feedback chain, you know. But Hendrix could be like... 10 feet away from the amp and get the, just, just the most, um, deafening roaring feedback going, you know, but could control, totally control it at the same time. You know, it's like, you know, it's like he had everything kind of potted up to 10, you know, the amp, the guitar, the, you know, the effects, you know, the, the, the room monitors, you know, I mean, everything was blasting, but, um, when those, those ghost tones started coming through, 
you know, and kind of bringing their howls and their dissonance. You know, he was completely in control of it. And it's like when you watch him play, you see footage of him playing. You you can see that like on his face that, you know, he's so um, such a practice, such a, a student of, of his own practice room. You know what I mean? Um, and his own kind of inner musical muse. You can see on his face that. Um, he knows what notes are going to come next. You know, it's like he's singing uh, these things in the being, you know, before he's actually playing it. There's like a split second differential between the expression on his face and what comes next on the instrument. You know, with some people, it might it might seem that, you know, what's coming out of guitar is then followed by the facial expression. With Hendrix, it's almost like the facial expression is just a beat ahead. You know, and I mean, these are all these are all just, you know, some of the gifts he had, you know, as 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 a musician, you know, as a virtuoso, you know, as a as a visionary. You know, if you're learning to to play uh, a reed or a brass in an instrument, if you if you if you're training in conservatory, you're actually you're encouraged to actually um, sing the things that you're going to play, you know, as a way of, you know, strengthening your ear and your connection to the music and I mean he seems to have in his own autodidact way figured out a way to make the guitar and to make his guitar and his voice one because that's another thing as well like there are just so many instances where he's um he's playing and he's 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 playing impossible things and he's singing along with them at the same time and you know he's completely improvising you know what I mean so there's just a a knowledge of the instrument um, that's present there, of um, you know note sequences and patterns and scales. You know, he's just completely aware of well, not even so much aware, but he's like he's 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 um, he's uh, harmonizing with the guitar. You know, in so many so many places in the music. You know, live especially. You know, I mean, that's a part of the blues guitar tradition, you know, to, to play things and to, and to sing, sing them at the same time or to, you know, do call and response with your voice and your instrument. But um, with Hendrix, I mean, some of the things he's playing are just so, like, abstract and baffling, you know, and, and one of a kind that it's, uh, it, it's amazing. And you know that, um, you know, he's he may have never played that particular uh, stream of notes before, but you know, he, his voice is just right on top of some of the strangest um, kind of sequences of, of, of notes and, and rhythm that he's playing. In the Decavit show, shortly after the Woodstock Festival 1969, Jimi Hendrix was asked about his interpretation of the U.S. national anthem there. The talk show host used the word controversial to describe it, to which the guitarist simply replied, I thought it was beautiful. Woodstock wasn't the first time Hendrix transformed the national anthem during a performance. He had already started playing parts of it live in 1968. Ever since then, there have been discussions about the meaning he wanted to convey with this. What's your take on it? Well, I mean, the thing about the song is that it's... Um It's a national anthem that's already kind of in celebration of war and the sounds of war. You know, in the lyrics, it talks about the rocket's red glare and the bombs bursting in air. It's just an odd, you know, but I mean, not even odd. I mean, it's it's um, in some ways its choice as the national anthem is in sync with, uh, you know, the notion of America as a place kind of born in violence and revolution and blood. You know, at the time, of course, of the Woodstock performance, you know, he um, he was acutely aware of, of the fact that Vietnam was going on. I mean, Vietnam was on television every night. So the sounds of that war, you know, just because of embedded journalists, became very familiar to anyone who watched the nightly news. But, I mean, of course, Hendrix had been in the military, had been a paratrooper, so he also knew just the sound of, of, uh, of guns from the practice range and the sound of, uh, 
that the wind made, you know, when jets are roaring and you're jumping out of the, the plane with your rifle, you know what I mean? Um, and I think all of those things had been assimilated into his, um, his sensorium, you know, into his, his musical nervous system. So, you know, on one hand, of course, I mean, it can't not be read as, you know, his own kind of musical meta commentary on the Vietnam War, you know, but it's also a statement about the anthem itself, you know, which is very much in celebration of war and the sounds of war. So there's a double kind of commentary going on there about America, you know, as just an inherently kind of war celebrating uh, nation, war kind of violence embracing nation. When you actually think about Star Spangled Banner in tandem with the performance he'll give at New Year's Eve at the Fillmore of Machine Gun, you know, which is very directly about the Vietnam War, but I think that they they form a a kind of diptych, kind of musical diptych. You know, it's a suite where he's um, he's sonically representing the the zeitgeist. You know, because that battle, as he acknowledges, or that that sense of the society being at war, is not just going on in Vietnam. You know, it's like he makes a, he draws the parallel out between the anti-war activists and the the young men and women who had been sent to fight in Vietnam. He kind of sees them as players on the same, you know, theater of, in the same theater of war. Those two performances, I mean, just they just have a, a magic to them that was unparalleled in his own work and certainly in terms of, you know, it's become almost de rigueur for, you know, rock guitarists to do, you know, American rock guitarists in particular to do their own version of the Star Spangled Banner, but it usually sounds so on the nose patriotic, you know, and his is very complicated, you know, and uh, and he really lets you know how complicated it is with that introduction to machine gun, we said this is for all the soldiers fighting in Milwaukee and Chicago, and oh yes, almost as an afterthought, Vietnam. You know what I mean? So you know because we know that there in the Vietnam War produced a war on two fronts. You know there was everything that was going on. You know in that very politically complicated war of national liberation by the Vietnamese. You know after a succession of invaders or with a succession of invaders from. Chinese to the French and then the Americans and the way in which uh, American triumphalism and American innocence got shut down, you know what I mean? Got, got really saw defeat, you know, and, and experienced like a uh, loss of a staggering kind, you know, because of that conflict. But some of the, you know, but that, that war in itself, the feedback effect of that war was to create a battle on the streets you know, of uh, um, in the States, you know, through the anti-war movement, you know. And so, um, you know, Hendrix is really taking, he is taking his capacity to do what he called sound paintings, you know, and bringing it into the realm of social critique, uh, social commentary. You know, he's kind of giving us, it's, it's sonic reportage. And you can see the impact that it, it had in terms of just documentary filmmaking and films like Apocalypse Now. It's very much, it's like the sound of a film like Apocalypse Now is so clearly inspired by the Hendrix's soundscapes, you know, not just the, the moment where you literally hear a guitar player, you know, coming out of a cassette speaker, but even the synthesizer music, you know, kind of the eerie ghostliness of that music. I think is very much inspired by the kind of sounds, the kind of howling, shrieking, banshee, ghost sounds that Hendrix created with um, with the Star Spangled Banner performance and the Machine Gun performance. One of the things I love most on his album Electric Ladyland is the sounds he produces at the end of House Burning Down, which is a song about another scene of fighting. Sure, sure. I mean, yeah, I mean, because that's his first really direct acknowledgement of um, the black liberation struggle that was going on and um, the kinds of uh, urban uprisings and rebellions, some called them riots, you know, that were occurring uh, in the States in Watts and 
Detroit and Newark, and then after the death of Martin Luther King, all over the country. So yeah, that sense of house burning down was literal. It was literally like the interior of America being aflame because of um, how aflame, uh, you know, and, and incendiary racial conflict had become and the, um, the rebellion against racism really by the black community. There have been sporadic episodes of that kind of um, rebellion in black America before, but it hadn't been connected to a political program like that of the black power movement and that of uh, the black Panther movement, which saw, which advocated, you know, black Americans, not just fighting back, but shooting back and using um, uh, the option of the Molotov cocktail to really express, you know, this rage against white supremacy in America, you know, so in house burning down, I mean, Jimmy, Jimmy really makes, you know, this, this song that's, that's very much about that kind of conflict. He makes it, he makes it visceral. He makes it audible. You know, he, the way he's using flanging and phasing, you know, on, on the guitar, you know, just sounds like wildfire and wildcats at the same time too. So you kind of get this wildfire effect and then this, you know, these, these rampaging panther kind of sounds going on in the same song. Please correct me if I'm wrong. I always had the impression that in the lyrics of that song, he's advising the black community not to use violence. I found a quote where he said, it's insane to burn down his brother's house. You know, I mean, I think he, he definitely saw himself as, um, I think, more an advocate of uh, Martin Luther King's approach to, to trying to negotiate a peace, in a sense between um, white America, black America, you know, but at the same time, I mean, you can't think of anybody whose music, I mean, has more kind of aggression and, 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 and violence and kind of um, a quality of striking out in it, you know. It's not pacifist music. The emotional tenor of the music is operating at, at just a high pitch of uh of rage and outrage and rebellion and is you know is testing and transgressing and breaking through you know all kinds of orthodoxies and, and boundaries around what's acceptable in terms of how you speak how you dress how you deal with authority i think though that he you know he was just very much aware of the the potential cost the loss of life that could occur you know if the black community tried to openly declare war on white America, you know, being, as one pundit said, always outnumbered and always outgunned, you know. So that full frontal approach, I think he didn't think was necessarily going to be the one, going to be the way that um, changed the social and economic political position of, of black America. And in fact, what we know now in, in retrospect is that in some ways it was, the, it was um, all of those factors Uh, kind of working in tandem, you know, not necessarily in a coordinated way, but, you know, there's something about the threat of black violence that gets white America's ear and attention, you know, and um, we see this with, you know, with Black Lives Matter, with some of the consequence of some of that activity, uh, particularly when it has turned into destruction of property and, and a certain kind of anti authoritarian uh, rebellion has been that um, the elite institutions of the society, the elite institutional, intellectual institutions of society um, seem to pay more attention to what the prophetic voices, you know, the poetic voices in black America are saying. They become more relevant and they start appearing on more awards lists, you know, um, for various kinds of um, recognition and They're more on television. They're more in conversation. You know, Hendrix, you know, just represents his generation in terms of people who in there really, you know, when you just think about how young they were, but then how sophisticated they were in terms of manipulating media to get their message across to their own generation. They were pretty cunning and savvy folks. I mean, Sly Stone and Dylan Beatles and and Hendrix, you know, I mean, they're masterful 
in terms of the way they engage with media um, to, you know, kind of represent a middle ground for their generation. I mean, these are people who very much want to participate in um, kind of the spoils of, of capitalism, you know, and have access to, um, you know, the mass media institutions, but they also represent people who, they represent the voiceless and they represent um, a certain disenchantment and uh, a certain alienation towards mainstream America too. Because this is not music. I mean, it's, you know, just when you think about that music, it has a challenging quality to it lyrically, uh, sonically, you know, melodically, politically. You know, they're coming from another America. It's not the America of the of, of what at that time was the three major networks in Madison Avenue. You know, it takes another 30 or 40 years become, before that music even becomes palatable, you know, to the, to the salesmen of America, of the American dream, you know, because at the time it was being created, it was, it was definitely threatening, you know. And Hendrix's music is just very, it's bracing, it's challenging to this day, you know what I mean? Um, the emotionality of it, as well as the dreaminess of it, the seductive, the sexual, the sensuality of it, you know. I mean, all these qualities of his music, you know, when you hear them direct from the source, you know, they they still just produce a complicated narrative in terms of the emotionality. You know, I mean, I think we can look at say what he may have said in interviews and or even in a song like House Burning Down, you know, where you know he's. You know, he's hoping aliens come down and help sort out the mess that humans have created for themselves. But if we go by just the spirit and the music itself, you know, I mean, he's creating a riot, you know, in the grooves. He's provoking and invoking rebellion, you know, in the in the music itself. You know, and I think and that's the thing about the blues as a as an idiom, you know, as an ethos. You know, I mean, it's very much about playing with those contradictions between um, what's literally said and then what's uh, what's really being expressed. Yeah, I mean, you just think about um, wow, so many examples, you know, some of the classic Robert Johnson things like come in my kitchen. At first, it seems about, you know, somebody looking for sexual salvation and then it takes this flip and it seems about you know, to be about somebody, um, you know, who's wronged and lonely and, you know, feels abandoned, you know, by his lover. You know what I mean? And it all goes on in the course of a few lyrics, you know, but, you know, you're you're pulled into this very complicated romantic reflection where it's, you know, in the one, you know, one minute the character is talking about their potency and then another one they're talking about their sense of loss. You know, you take something like Jimmy's, you know, voodoo child. I mean, it sounds like this thunderous statement from a god, you know, about about his powers. But then it becomes a song as well about about death, extinction, you know, annihilation, exhaustion, you know, hoping there's a there's an afterlife cuz you know, in this world, you know, the implication is he's kind of spent, you know. And um, you know, I mean, it's just always that duality that's going on in the blues between joy and pain, you know, often in the same song, you know, and I think um, Hendrix is enough of a bluesman to kind of revel in uh, that kind of complexity, that kind of duality, where the music can be, the lyrics can be advocating one thing and the music can be saying something else, you know what I mean, or um, um, transcending even the limits of the lyrics. I feel like he's giving us multiple points of view you know, um, in the interplay between, you know, the lyrics, the delivery of the song, you know what I mean? And then what's going on with music? Because, um, you know, I mean, he wasn't a belter or a shouter as a singer. You know, he was, you know, he was kind of a coaxer and a, and a seducer and a mumbler sometimes, you know. But I think he, he liked playing with that ambiguity between... Um, what his voice was doing and then what the guitar was doing, you know, cause you know, vocally he's, he, you know, he's, he can be purring a lot and then the guitar can just be slicing you up like a samurai. 
We'll come back to this ambiguity later, but let's first take a look at some of the imagery in his lyrics. Quite often angels and water worlds are presented as metaphors of salvation. Well, I mean, I think there's a way in which, again, the blues as an idiom is very much, it's very much obsessed with death, you know, and um, the vulnerability of the flesh, you know, and the violence of the world, particularly for black men who were trying to lead some kind of independent troubadour life in the South in the in the 20s and 30s and 40s and in the North in the 50s, you know. Um, so I think that he fundamentally saw himself as in this tradition of the, you know, the, the blues troubadour, you know, the the Robert Johnsons and, and blind Willie Johnsons and blind Willie McTells and and later on, um, you know, people like Buddy Guy and Otis Rush and Hal and Wolf, you know, um, these are characters that just seem very much committed to maintaining a, uh, a certain kind of fierceness and independence, you know, in the world and not backing down and not cowing down to anyone and kind of making their own way in the world, in a dangerous world, you know what I mean, in an extremely dangerous world. But that said, I mean, you know, we know that Hendrix was also a huge science fiction fan. So, you know, he he brings this um, very kind of uh, prophetic, I want to say, yeah, kind of prophetic sense of death from the blues. And but he combines it with um, the, these visions of the apocalypse, you know, and they occur again and again. You know, I mean, he's got at least, you know, three major pieces, you know, with uh, Third Stone from the Sun and Up from the Skies and and then 1983 of Merman I Will Be, they're, they're all about just the, the destruction of life on Earth by alien forces, you know, extraterrestrial forces, you know, or by um, some kind of form of, uh, of uh, nuclear annihilation. At the same time, you know, he, he also... You know, it's it's truly kind of apocalyptic vision in that, you know, he sees the the annihilation of one one way of life and then the resurrection of life in another form, you know, or in another day in the future. So he sees this rebirth, this, uh, you know, this this ending and this rebirth kind of occurring or being um, in a uh, in having an independent interdependent relationship with one another. You know, the world will come to an end, be a great flood, a great fire, uh, an invasion from above. But out of that, uh, these mutations will spring, you know, and these new life forms will spring. And um, he kind of has a romantic relationship with the new, with um, a kind of mutant evolution that will occur out of the, um, the ashes, you know, of the destruction. So there's all, you know, there's all this like, death and resurrection going on, you know, extreme, you know, kind of violent, catastrophic, you know, annihilation going on in the music that's then uh, followed or, or, or given counterpoint by the emergence of um, these new kind of, of uh, angelic beings. So, um, you know, it's, it's a very kind of uh, complete apocalyptic narrative that he's given us in a lot of this work. You know, I mean, from certain interviews, it's clear that he um, didn't necessarily see himself as living a a long life, you know. Um, It's clear from the productivity of the man within a very short period of time that he really felt like he had to get a lot done as quickly as possible. You know, I mean, just prodigious output, you know, within a short period of time. I mean, when we think about, you know, they're still releasing material that only the, the, the most dogged bootleggers have heard, you know, almost 50 years after his death. And that's because he just, he just lived, he spent so much time in the studio and just trying to get every idea, you know, and fragment of an idea down and the development of, of, of certain ideas, you know, to create a space for him in his archive. So, I mean, you know, this is somebody who had premonitions of death. And then because he had lost his mother uh, when he was 
he was younger, you know what I mean? She was, you know, she's the angel that comes down to heaven to, or, or who he hopes will come down to heaven to rescue him, you know what I mean? And there's certain conversations he had with his mother in dreams that seemed to occur pretty frequently, you know what I mean? So in terms of that relationship with the the feminine, you know, mom is, is kind of a source point or a beginning, you know, point of that in the music as well. And the whole notion of, you know, the mother being this uh, matriarchal protector angel kind of figure, but also being somebody who's, um, who's very distant and, and unpredictable and inaccessible, you know, I mean, that kind of turns up, you know, in the, in, in the work as well. It's a very fraught kind of relationship, you know, cause it's not, um, it's not Madonna whore. It's like angel and avatar, you know, I think just because of, you know, some of the tribulations and trials of Hendrix's life, he definitely sought out relationships with women who were, you know, very strong and, and very much protective kind of figures. I mean, and it's interesting because the three that come to mind, Fane Pridgen and and Kathy Etchingham and um, Linda Keith, you know, those women, when you see interviews with them, you know, 5, 10, 15, 25 years after Hendrix's death, you know, they just seem like very rock solid you know, uh, indomitable kind of figures, you know, so he was really drawn to these very strong, powerful women, you know, in spite of, you know, the fact that, um, like, you know, every rock star in their twenties, you know, I mean, he had innumerable relationships, you know, with, with, um, women who were fans and casual encounters and all that kind of thing. But the women who were really close to him, you know, Pat Hartley's and Fane's and Linda Keith's and so forth. I mean, you know, these pre these turned out to be pretty uh uh durable and um intellectually very very sophisticated people, you know. Um, who really understood him, you know, emotionally, spiritually, creatively, you know, and supported him, you know, gave him a certain kind of energy and recognition that he needed, you know, cause I think in some ways, because he wasn't in terms of his own, uh, personality, you know, like a typical kind of macho guy, you know, um, I think he really saw a lot of these, these women as being, you know, doppelgangers, you know, or in some ways, you know, um, mirrors for, you know, uh, himself kind of in the world is like, you know, a black man in a predominantly white world. Joe Brewer is the director of a documentary called Jimi Hendrix, The Guitar Hero. In one of the scenes, he presents Dolores Hall Ham, a sister of Lucille Hendrix, his mother, who died when he was 15 years old. His aunt was one of the women who took care of him during his adolescence, and here she says, I really think that was his objective to go home to meet his mother, who he always wanted to be with. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, because he, he really, you know, he, he and his brother were basically raised by the dad. And there were times when, when you know, the father had, because of his hardships, um, you, know, the, the, you know, his brother Leon went into a foster home or, you know, Jimmy might spend time with... Um, with, uh, rel you know, family relatives, you know, so going back, that experience of going back and forth between homes and having a mother who was distant in some ways because of, um, you know, her own battles with mental illness, you know what I mean, and with alcoholism. So there's that sense of her being so close and so far at the same time, you know. And I mean, you know, and all of that, I mean, you know, this becomes like part of the part of this, the text of, uh, of the music, of the lyrics, you know what I mean? Like uh, Hendrix's sense of, you know, alienation, abandonment, you know, some of his, uh, you know, his fears of uh, being alone, of, of uh, you know, not finding a community or, or, or a partner, you know, or, or a home life, you know, of kind of in some ways always being, um, you know, a creature of the road and at the mercy of the next gig or the next hit, the next toke or what have you. 
you know. I mean, these are all things that lend themselves to, you know, somebody self-medicating and, uh, you know, trying to push back the a certain kind of darkness, you know. Yeah. Talking about darkness, I have idolized Hendrix for almost 50 years. Having read so much about him and looking at lyrics like Little Wing or Angel, you create this image of this guy as an adorable person. But when you delve deep into the many biographies, you notice this guy beat up women. This is something I can't really square. What's your take on that? Yeah, I mean, I think that um, um, when you, you know, I, I mean, you know, this in some ways this is, you know, it relates to the story of black people in America, you know what I mean, as, as um, you know, kind of the decades-long victims of incredible violence, you know, and just the whole... Um, You know the the master slave relationship is a very violently paternal, you know, patriarchal relationship, and so what we've had in the black community uh, over the years has been this this kind of revisiting of the violence of whites on blacks of of blacks onto their children, and also the children experiencing domestic violence you know, violence between parents, you know what I mean? And the thing is that um, there's always, uh, there's just this suppressed rage that's present, you know, in any uh, kind of oppressed group, oppressed members of society. It's not uncommon for it to be expressed towards, you know, the people you are most intimate with. You know, I was reading a statistic the other day that just said that um, most women, most white women in America uh, who die of gun violence, you know, almost all of them die at the hands of a domestic partner. You know, I, I mean, I, I don't think it's about, you know, getting into, um, you know, this uh, accounting of the number of times this may have occurred, but I know that, um, you know, Hendrix was the, you know, he was the, 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 the product of, uh, as most American men are, you know, of a patriarchal, misogynist, violent, you know, anti, anti-black, anti-woman culture. You know, when I, when I think about, you know, those people that we, we, actually consider to be icons and heroes of of movements whether musical or political you know from the 60s like i'm just astounded when i have to think about how young they were when they were doing these amazing things you know and the fact that they were doing them in a in a period you know when there was just incredible the incredible risk of violence so when i look at you know martin luther king or malcolm x or the black panthers You're talking about people who are in their their twenties and some of whom died like at forty, you know. And I think it just speaks to the degree to which, you know, any of us can be at a young age, we can be incredibly intellectually mature and politically maybe mature, but maybe emotionally, you know, some other steps have to occur. Um You know, Hendrix after therapy <laughs> would be, you know, you know, could could have been an amazing human being to encounter. Uh, you know, I'm I'm a I'm a believer that that the thing that we consider to be somebody's best reflection, their art, they're they're a vessel for that. They're a channel for that. That energy is coming from somewhere else. It's and you know it's inexplicable and it's mysterious, but we know that it's um, incredibly rare because those people who operate at the highest frequency of that are pretty much one-offs. They're one of a kind. You know, there's, you know, there's only one Nina Simone and one Miles Davis and one Bob Dylan and one Jimi Hendrix and one Billie Holiday, you know. And it's in a world full of uh, singers and trumpeters and guitar players and composers and 
Shantusas, you know, but um, there's something about the way all, it's just the alchemy of that person's kind of internal distress and uh, aesthetic sensibility and the ability to tell stories um, out of their own emotional core that just reach millions of people. You know, uh, there's something in the sound, you know, and it's totally in the, in the sound, you know, that's, it's just unique to that, to that person, you know, and, um, I think that there's a marriage, you know, it's kind of a marriage of heaven and hell that happens in those great talents, man, because you just can't explain like how they're able to just consistently do, you know, song after song after song, you know, to create this body of work that just like rocks people, you know, like, you know, 20, 30, 40 years after they've gone, after they've left the scene, you know? Um, and so, you know, I mean, I think with somebody like Hendrix, man, like clearly, you know, he was one of the chosen, <laughs> you know? And, um, you know, how else do you explain somebody that young just slow shows up having so much stuff together in terms of their art, you know? And the whole thing is when you put kind of fame, celebrity, drugs, depression, melancholy, premonitions of death, you know, crooked managers, you know, threats of violence against your person because you're challenging management, you know, you know, you're just talking about a, a very volatile, anxious and un, underdeveloped human being, you know. And, um, yeah, I mean, you know, we don't want to hear, you know, about you know, the misogyny of some of our great male artists, you know, whether it's Miles or or Hendrix, but it's a part of the narrative. You can't write it out. You know, you're just left with the fact that through through their own kind of veil of tears, you know, they can push out these amazing notes that enrapture and and enchant us. Uh, Even if you don't want to believe kind of in the transcendentalist mystical notion of that energy coming from one place, you know, uh, you know, or, you know, using a human body to kind of get into the world. The thing is that, um, you know, that, that sound that they, that they make is really, um, some, it's just a very refined, powerful abstraction, you know, of the energy within the person, you know, and the, the poetry within a person, you know, and there's nothing that says that, you can't be the most uh, sensitive and sophisticated poet and still be an ass and not still be an asshole too, you know. <laughs> Clearly, I mean, it's just you know, it's it's like, and if we kind of, you know, I mean, and I, you know, and it's like I I actually encounter folks who, you know, maybe just because of the way information is kind of presented today, like what they may learn about a Miles Davis or a Jimi Hendrix or a Billie Holiday is kind of the worst aspects of their behavior. And it's such a turnoff, they don't even want to listen to the music. You know, for better or worse, like we had the advantage of not even knowing, you know, until much later in life, these other stories about these folks. And by that time, you know, we were already seduced. You know, we were already captured, you know. Uh, they had us for life, you know, but I mean, this is part of, you know, we also know too, that the, we know this from our own friends. We know this from our own family, like having to feel the contradictions, you know, of people you love is a part of being an adult, you know, and you don't have to apologize for it or excuse it, but you know, that knowledge, that kind of, uh, you know, disruption or kind of, uh, you know, uh, dissipation of one's innocence, you know, is a part of what being adult and aware in the world is kind of all about. It kind of comes with the package. You know, if you live long enough, you're going to know uncomfortable things about your parents' marriage, you know, but you're still going to love them. (laughs) You know what I mean? (laughs) You know, yeah. I mean, I'm just saying, you know, it's just, it's just going to, and especially now, you know, where everybody's stuff is just nakedly, out there, you know, on the table, like, you just have to decide, like, is this information you have about somebody's personal dealings, you know, um, so 
just uh, untenable that you're going to stop looking at their art or stop reading their books or stop listening mm-hmm. to their music. And, you know, in some cases that, you know, that they may certainly be the case. Uh, or you just keep a certain distance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, um, yeah, I mean, I can't, I can't imagine my world without the possibility of Hendrix's music, yet, you know, despite the troubling things I know about his relationships with, uh, you know, his, you know, his, his, some of his misogyny. Yeah. The German sociologist and writer Klaus Teweleit was born in the same year as Hendrix, in 1942. He said that Hendrix's music had some kind of transformative power on his body that had been made hard by fascist ideas during his adolescence. He also observed that in other men. This reminded me of something you wrote in your book. He was a destabilizer of stereotypes of black masculinity. Could you elaborate on that? Well, I mean, I, I think that um, with Hendrix, you know, he's a destabilizer also of um, the white male body in that period in terms of its relationship to black masculinity and black sexuality as well. And by that, I mean that at a time when there was very little social exchange and recognition of, of black men by white men, just in general in society, or where the relationship was one in which um, black men were were expected to to be subservient in the presence of white masculinity. You know, Hendrix emerges as this power figure that white men are, you know, young men, white men are bowing down to as their god. A friend of mine, and I, I think I have the anecdote in the book, but um, it's a trumpet player I work with, Flip Barnes, grew up in Virginia, one of the most racist states you know, in the union. I mean, I think they had laws against interracial marriage almost until 1970, you know, but um, he was one of the first groups of, uh, probably one of the first groups of uh, young blacks to integrate a segregated school system, you know, in Virginia. So, you know, one of the first to go to schools that were predominantly, had been predominantly white, you know, and he played on the, the basketball team, you know, which was called the Panthers, you know, yeah. even before he got there, you know, that was the, the name of it. And, 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 you know, ended up being, a, I think, a predominantly black squad. But he just talked about how he he had a um, a cousin who was in the Black Panthers that told him to go see Jimi Hendrix. Now, at the time, you have to understand, in the black community, Hendrix was considered something of, uh, you know, what people call an Oreo. You know, black on the outside, white on the inside, you know, because all the the propaganda and photographs saw him. He was just always surrounded by white people did not seem to be connected to, um, um, this very, very, uh, visible struggle against injustice that was going on in the black community, you know, definitely seemed an outlier, you know? Um, and so, but this cousin who was in the black Panthers, he tells, uh, my friend flip, he says, you have to go see Jimi Hendrix. And Flip's response is, man, why do I want to go see this guy? I mean, he just hangs out with white people, you know. And his cousin just says, no, like, you have to go see him. This is a bad motherfucker. You got to go see Hendrix, right? So he goes to see Hendrix, and he's blown away, you know, um, for life, you know. But he says that what blew him away even more was the fact that all he saw at the same concert, he saw the same guys that would call him nigger every day at school. But he said they were just genuflecting before Hendrix. Like if Hendrix had asked them to, to give them his their girlfriends, they would have done it. You know, it was just such a complete reversal, you know, of the way in which they dealt with other black people, other black men, you know, within their social sphere. And, the way Hendrix, you know, um, because of his Hendrixness, <laughs> right, um, just com- completely subdued that savage racist beast within them. So, you know, I mean, it just speaks to so many things at the same time, you know, about how 
you know, so much of the violence that's directed at black people has to do, particularly at black men, you know, by white authority figures, has to do with a kind of enchantment and seduction and a terror at the same time. The novelist Toni Morrison has this uh, just horrific but enlightening passage in her book Sula where like a black woman character is taunting a black male character by talking about um, how much uh, white men say, she says like, you know, the whole world loves you. So white men love you so much. They want to cut your balls off and take them home with them, you know, but literally, I mean, that happened in numerous lynchings, you know, where people were cutting off the genitalia of black men and put it, and taking them home and putting them in the jars, man, you know, and Morrison says, you know, in the novel, she said, if that's not love, I don't know what is, you know. But, you know, so you've got like that kind of ambivalence and confusion, you know, going on in terms of, you know, this relationship of the the white male body to the black male body historically. And then you have somebody like Hendrix who, who just shows up and kind of turns, you know, uh, the white male world upside down, you know, just through his, 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 uh, his mastery, <laughs> you know, of, uh, and his presence and his cool, you know, and his virtuosity, you know, and his imagination and, uh, all of those things, you know, and again, I mean, I, the word I come back to again and again with Hendrix, uh, you know, the words are, you know, it's like seduction and magic, you know what I mean? He's literally, Every time we look at him on film, he seems to be performing a magic trick or a series of magic tricks. You know, I mean, um, he's just doing impossible things with his body, with his mind, you know, with his his sound that completely transport us, you know, into this other realm where only see, he seems to exist, you know, where the the impossible is his stock and trade. And it just has this, you know, it just, um, because of the range of people who claim Hendrix as an avatar, as a an icon, you know, as a mystical figure, as a musical genius, um, you know, I mean, we know that he had the, the power to, to affect a whole lot of different kinds of bodies, you know, and to kind of unite people through the, their differences as well, you know, because... Uh, you know, Hendrix had a huge impact on the on the black gay community, you know, that became really emergent, you know, um, in the 70s. In the 70s, when the gay rights movement kind of found its own expression within the black community. And so um, there, because of Hendrix, though, there were a number of kind of young gay men that felt more comfortable about how they dressed in public. You know, just wearing kind of long, flowing, colorful garments and you know men wearing scarves and you know men carrying you know bags and wearing headbands and all these kinds of things it's like you can really see Hendrix's impact just on the fashion world in general you know not just the music world you know um in the 70s you know and the way other rock stars started to dress you know I mean glam certainly comes out of you know Hendrix kind of playing with masculine feminine kind of portrayals and uh adornment you know, jewelry, you know, all these kinds of things. He made that kind of androgyny, that kind of couture, pop and popular. Yeah, you know, and um, and of course, you know, so we see his impact on on uh, the theatricality of a Bowie, of Kiss, of, you know, George Clinton and Parliament Funkadelic and Earth, Wind and & Fire and, you know, Prince and on up through, you know, Lenny Kravitz and Fishbone and Terrence Trent Darby, I mean, we could go on, you know, but he freed up the masculine body in terms of his expressivity, you know, just through the way he carried himself in the world, you know, and the fact that, um, you know, I mean, which he had, uh, he had adopted from a uh, little Richard who talks about in, you know, in the, in the Joe Boyd film about, you know, he says, yeah, he said, Hendrix didn't mind looking freaky, like I don't mind. And he got it from me, <laughs> you know? So you got these men who show up in an incredibly uh, kind of macho period of American history. You know, I mean, America's at war, you know, and people at war with 
with authority figures, you know what I mean? And um, there's a lot of uh, kind of back and forth, you know, going on in terms of uh, attack and counterattack, you know, that we, you know, we associate with just male aggression, expressions of male aggression. And Hendrix is like as aggressive as anybody in his art, you know, but in, in his presentation, you know, I mean, he's, he's kind of a, like a fairy tale figure, man, you know. He's a romantic poet, you know, a romantic troubadour, you know, on the scene. And he's kind of challenging these notions of hard and soft and masculine and, and feminine, you know, like how sensitive, you know, one can be in terms of one's masculine address, you know, through your voice, you know, just to speak the way you speak, you know. That was an era where a lot of people were shouting and screaming, and like you know, he's he's being really, he's being coy and snarky and sarcastic and giggly, and totally comfortable with himself, you know. Clearly, you know, as a uh, as a stud, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know. Um, but um, you know, he's playing with those codes, man. He's playing with those masculine, feminine codes, and he encouraged a whole generation of guys, you know. Black, white, British, German, you know, Italian, Nigerian, <laughs> like, uh, you know, because Fela's, Fela's got a bit of Jimmy in him, too, you know. But, I mean, you know, and it's something that Hendrix had kind of, and this kind of, in some ways, kind of doubles back to your, you know, the point you raised about, you know, his violence towards women. Um, there's a certain degree in which that presentation as a style in the black community comes from uh it comes from pimp culture uh because those guys dress really flamboyantly you know really colorfully you know dressed in ways that kind of defy certain kind of masculine codes and they got their hair done more often than the women in their stables did you know got really feminine looking hair and they hung out a lot with um you know, I noticed from, from what people told me about the Harlem scene, like a lot of the, you know, the pimps and the hustlers hung out with the, um, you know, the gay cats and the transvestites and so forth. You know, it was kind of one, one freaky scene, you know, that was going on there. So there's a certain kind of that it's some of that, that kind of bisexuality, that androgyny, you know, I mean, it comes from, um, that from Harlem hustler culture, pimp culture, you know, and those guys were part of their whole behavioral modification of the women who worked for them was to go between being like very sensitive and understanding and then turn on the dime to being incredibly violent as well. You know, and I think for, you know, it's just, you know, guys who are like Kendricks who aren't following, you know, never really had uh, necessarily a traditional male model that they wanted to kind of grow up like. I mean, you know, he had a fraught relationship with his dad, you know, because of his dad's own violence, you know, uh, propensity towards violence from what I've, what I've heard. You know, and he probably knew the, knew those kind of guys when he was in Seattle, probably saw them. They were probably part of, you know, the cultural scene, the community scene that he saw. You know, and certainly when he got to New York, came to Harlem, you know, they were kind of there in their peacock, peacock glory. And I would just say in terms of um, the gentleman that talked about his impact on the, you know, the German male body, I mean, we could, you know, I think we could, we could kind of parse that and say a certain fraction of that was a Hendrix and a certain fraction of it was acid, you know. In 2003, you wrote in your book that pop music is still being racially slotted, targeted and marketed in America. And Hendrix is still not being played on so-called black radio stations. Is this still the case or has this changed? It's like we're in such a kind of post-radio age in terms of um, the definition and the dissemination of the popular in terms of black culture. You know, I mean, because so, you know, it's like the Internet, you know, and um, file sharing and streaming services, you know, kind of the fragmentation of uh, the notion of community that used to come through radio. Um, has occurred that no, I don't think anybody expects to hear much of anything that they like, you know, on contemporary radio, you know, because people just have other choices. So, 
if you can afford it, you know, if you, you know, you may be, you may have the kind of employment that requires you to be in your car a lot. So you may decide to get a satellite radio service in there. You may carry your own CD mixes in there, or, you know, you may just listen to whatever, just flip between the dials, you know, but that kind of consensus that radio produced around what black music was and what the black audience liked. I mean, that era is just done, you know, I think. Um, And I think it's just done in in pop culture in general. You know, who knows what anybody is is listening to at this point that is necessarily gives you some kind of coherent picture of musical taste now in, in, you know, in America in particular, you know, and I mean, every year, man, I watch I watch the Grammys. I found them, you know, they're acts selling millions of, of downloads that I never even heard of, you know, that like are selling out stadiums, you know. And uh, uh, I think in the past you would just, you know, everybody kind of knew who these people were, even if they didn't listen to them. You know, I mean, like, you know, I grew I went to all black high school, you know, uh, in Washington, D.C., and, you know, everybody knew who David Bowie and Kiss and Led Zeppelin were, even if that wasn't their thing. But, you know, it's just a different kind of moment now. But I think um, the thing is, like, right after Hendrix died, you just saw this his, this immediate, the immediate impact of his music and Sly Stone's music on the next generation of R&B, you know, the people who became definitive. You know, the Al Greens and LaBelles and Wars and Funkadelics and and Earth, Wind, and Fires, and Rufus, and Shaka Khan, all these folks, Stevie Wonder, you know, you could hear, you could hear the impact that um, Hendrix, and the Beatles, and Dylan, you know, had on black popular music of of the time. You know, it's kind of like this latency between um, the advent of um, of hippie culture, kind of in white America, and then its own, it's kind of adoption and transfiguration inside of black America, you know, I mean, it was like a kind of a lag time in a way. But, I mean, Hendrix is kind of one of the ways in which, uh, you know, hippie culture came into black culture in terms of in terms of fashion, in terms of drugs, in terms of music. But the musicians were the ones that, you know, the young musicians, the musicians who were uh, maybe a couple of years younger than Hendrix that became uh, really influential figures in the, in the 70s. You know, like, they caught it immediately, like, the fact that this guy had just turned the world, had just opened the world of sound up to a whole new palette, you know, and they wanted that palette in their music as well. And, you know, so in that period, you know, when really bands and um, solo performers like Stevie Wonder, who are writing and producing their own material, for the first time really become the dominant voices in R&B, you know, you immediately hear and see the impact of, of Hendrix, like, um, you know, not only in what cats are playing, but what they're wearing, you know, but then, you know, I mean, you know, I'm part of this organization, Black Rock Coalition, you know, she started in 85 in in New York. And, um, you know, and in some ways, we're still dealing with the marginalization of black musicians in the contemporary rock tradition. Um, There's a certain way in which in America, you know, black bands, guys that play instruments, guys and women that play instruments, are still not allowed within the the alt rock um, circuit, even though they may be making music that is um, aesthetically parallel to what some of their their white generational counterparts are doing. It's like the gatekeepers, the arbiters of that particular side of the American you know musical coin, you know seem to still be making the same kind of concerted effort to uh, impose a kind of musical apartheid, you know, on uh, on the rock field in a, in America. It's interesting to, to see that the reasons that we created a Black Rock Coalition in 1985, are, you know, have, have still present uh, the same kinds, of, it's like the same kind of issues still have to be addressed, you know, like 35 years on. Winding up this interview, we are moving towards transcendence of some sort. Your book on Hendrix starts with a wonderful meditation in which you draw up some connections between the German poet Rainer Maria Rilke and Jimi Hendrix. Maybe you could enlighten us about them. Oh, man. Um, Well, I mean, I think this is the thing, is that, um, you know, 
Hendrix is, uh, he produced multiple mythologies, you know, because of his, uh, his physical presence, his sexuality, sensuality, erotic quality of his performances, and, you know, produced another kind of uh, reverence because of his virtuosity on the instrument, you know, uh, you know, his, the way he just kind of reinvented the guitar for all time. There's the science fiction aspect to his work. He's one of the, the proto Afrofuturist artists. He's Afrofuturist before there's a, a name for it or even a recognition that it might be a movement, you know, because he's creating the same period as Sun Ra, you know, and as obsessed with, um, kind of portraying himself certainly as a black man from outer space you know so there's this there's already you know there's kind of multiple ways in which he's transcending racial stereotype and cliche and convention you know just by being as outlandishly and uh spectacularly an alienist you know a kind of speculative uh, fiction writer with with sound and lyrics at a time when I think the gravity of events on the ground in America couldn't have been uh, heavier and and um, kind of more oppressive in their kind of daily reporting. He's saying, "Well, look to the stars, <laughs> you know, or join me here, you know, in these other dimensions, these other realms, you know, these places I can go to with sound." You know that will take you away from the the dross and the dreariness and the grossness and the, the the primitivism of the contemporary political social scene. But you know, I mean, we know that he also, and I think this is you know this is this is true. I think of a lot of uh, great composers, you know, uh, throughout history. Um, they have an evangelical streak. They have a sense of spiritual mission. They recognize that they have this capacity to speak to people's souls in a most direct, you know, unfiltered, unexpurgated, you know, unmuddied manner. You know, they can get right to the heart of people as I, you know, as I was talking about, you know, those racist young white guys in Virginia that um, hated the black guys that they, you know, played basketball with or went to school with every day. But Hendrix represented, they didn't even see blackness when they saw Hendrix. They just, they just experienced something that kind of took them out of um, their kind of primitive racial uh, mindset, you know. Um, and I think he recognized that there was that power in his music, that, he, that his music had the power to kind of bind these communities that were uh, um, at odds with one another you know, had historically been in a a kind of pitched battle, you know, around uh, race and place in America. You know, when he got to the point of articulating for himself, like, what genre he saw his music as, he said it was Sky Church music, which, you know, which meant that he was really thinking about... Um, not church in the sense of this place of worship that took place, you know, in a building, you know, between walls, you know, and had the traditional kind of architecture and hierarchical relationship of preacher to parishioners. But no, he saw it as something that um, really was a, a kind of energy that like electromagnetic energy, you know, or gravity, you know, which just could be present in the atmosphere that people lived in. And the music could actually create that space where that energy could get charged and it could be transmitted and it could transform, you know, folks at the same time, you know. Um, and um, because he's also a kind of Orphic figure, you know, somebody who's, he's taking his, you know, his lyre, his, you know, his lyre, his guitar, you know, um, his musicality into down to hell, you know what I mean? On a romantic, you know, uh, rescue mission, you know? And I think he kind of saw the people who were drawn to him, who were magnetized by him, um, 
as you know in his own humble way as people that you know could use some tweaking could use some retuning you know some liberating and opening up you know and as much as his music is associated with uh with drug taking you know i mean we know that um hendrix's music is a drug <laughs> unto itself you know what i mean so yeah. you know um and when you when you imbibe when you ingest you know what i mean when you take that hit that toke of hendrix's music you know he becomes the uh the hallucinogen you know or his sound becomes the hallucinogen you know and he's giving you these complex mythical extraterrestrial transdimensional kind of pictures to carry away you know whether he's doing it with lyrics or you know with 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 a guitar or with a beat you know but i mean he's putting you on some some other kind of ground you know uh putting you in this other kind of uh sacred space another no a new kind of new notion of a sacred secular space or a secular sacred space which um uh, you know, John Coltrane was interested in that space. Sun Ra was interested in that space. Miles Davis, you know, Bitches Brew, you know, became interested in that in that space. So kind of creating a new landscape for the mind, for the imagination through sound. You know, uh, the possibility of you, without even chemical enhancement, you know, being drawn um, into another realm, man. Yeah. Yeah. 